Anytime. Okay, well, I'm going to make a, a bald statement. Everybody knows the U.S. is losing out on manufacturing. China is winning and making everything. Uh, should we worry well, about this? Um, should we worry? No, I don't think we should worry. I think in general, uh, our manufacturing output is doing fairly well. Um, it suffered greatly during the Great Recession, where mm -hmm. output fell by over 20 percent. Um, but uh, we've made some great strides since then and have recovered uh, well over 90 percent of that lost output. And it looks like it's on path to continue to expand uh, over the next couple of years. But but employment has just shrunk over time and everything. I mean, which is which is why I remain optimistic about manufacturing. Uh, employment uh, has fallen. Uh, not in because we're not producing goods, it's because we're doing it ever more increasingly by being more efficient and more productive, as we use the term in economics. Has there, has there been a noticeable change in what is produced and how it's produced? And I'm thinking of uh, making steel, for example, uh, but uh, yeah. also textiles. Uh, uh, so two great examples. Um, so uh, I had the opportunity of a few years ago taking a tour of ArcelorMittal uh, steel manufacturing. It's the old inland steel back at the southern end of Lake Michigan in, in the northern Indiana. And uh, the tour was being given by an employee who had, a uh, retired employee, who had worked there back in the 60s and on and retired maybe about uh, 10, 15 mm -hmm. years earlier. Mm -hmm. uh, and so as I'm kind of walking around the plant with uh, this individual, I kind of said, well, tell me a little bit about how it was when you first were working here and so forth. And he kind of waved his hand and talked all about how, you know, back uh, then we had, you know, 25,000 people working and, yeah. you know, now we're only down to about a uh, little more than 5,000 workers. And so a huge drop. And then my next question was, well, what about output? Oh, oh, it's higher. Uh, so, you know, in, in yeah. part, it's reflecting the fact that we're able to produce more without the need of adding workers. What that ultimately does is it means that the uh, whatever you're producing, the labor content, the labor share of that mm -hmm. becomes a smaller and smaller slice of that cost pie. And what that, in essence, means is that your ability of competing against lower wage countries mm -hmm. becomes increasingly easier because uh, the wages are not a very big part of that equation. So I think that's largely why we have seen our industries remain quite successful. Now you go into an example, as you mentioned, apparel, footwear, and so forth. Um, those um, were really had low wages. Uh, right. It's the industries that have among the lowest wages in the United States. Well, you would think that if it's foreign competition, they would first go after your high wages because the cost differential would be the greatest. Except that the reason why the wages are so high is because they're far more skilled. Low wages, those workers are not very skilled. They're not substitutable for each other. Exactly. So okay. the, 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 the vast amount of excess right. labor around the world were in the low skill. Those are the areas that we really uh, suffer. Um, but even those industries, we're starting to see some of those come back. Mm -hmm. We're producing textiles once again in the United States. Now the factories are nothing like what they were uh, right. back in the 60s and 70s, uh, which had a lot of employment. You go in there, it's almost like an automotive factory, where you look down this huge factory and you see a handful of employees. And that's how you bring work back. Uh, well, you, you mentioned that. I, I had a chance to go through the Nissan plant in Jackson, Mississippi, where they make 12 different, they can make up to 12 different cars. And at On one the same assembly line. Yeah, and, and not in bunches. Right. And, I, and I never did see an SUV with a truck door on it or anything like that. But your point, I didn't see any people. Right. And so what they're doing is they're assembling things where the parts are being imported and the various components and they're just putting things together. So that's a different kind of manufacturing. Right. And, that's, and that has been the case uh, for a long time with the automotive side. And, and importing, really, I mean, some of it, yes, some of it might be imported from a foreign shore, but a lot of it is imported from factories that are surrounding the assembly plant. And in fact, they have that general rule that you don't want to have your uh, suppliers more than about 500 miles away. Right. Because 500 miles is roughly what a, a, a tractor trailer can cover in a day, uh -huh. um, a full, a full sure. day uh, run. 
uh, so you try to keep it within that so that you can just do that just in time right. type of production process. Um, one of the statistics that seems to me to be just fascinating at this point is that we have uh, more job vacancies than we have people who are unemployed. Um, how is this impacting uh, manufacturing and uh, what about the inflation implications of yeah. the wages? Uh, so it's been a it's been a real challenge. Uh, I think uh, not I think, but I know that when we talk to our manufacturing contacts, you ask them what is your biggest concern. Mm -hmm. Years ago, it used to be the cost of health care and, and, and right. how to shift some of that burden away from from them to mm -hmm. the workers and yet keep the workers happy and so forth. Uh, but today, in the last few years, without hesitation, their biggest challenge is finding skilled workers, qualified workers. Mm -hmm. Um, so, and, and many of them are, are beginning to acknowledge that they have to pay more, especially uh, at the lower uh, skill set. So, uh, they have been uh, having to compete more against uh, some of the uh, other type of industries that mm -hmm. use these lower skilled workers. So, the general wages have, have, been, have been rising. Again, I want to come back to, to China. Are we overplaying China and concerns about China when you consider our imports and exports from China are such a small portion of our GDP. Well, is is that a? I mean, are we making a mountain out of a molehill here? Well, I think I think China still represents a very large share of our trade in general. I mean, so sure. our biggest export destinations for U.S. made goods are Canada and, and, and Mexico. Mexico. And, Proximity matters. It's very easy to transport goods, uh, just drive across the border. Uh, but once you have to go beyond this uh, land uh, bridge that we have, uh, the country we send more goods to is China. So I think that uh, it's good that we are making a push to try to liberalize trade with the uh, second largest economy in the world, um, which, you know, uh, has basically double the tariff rates that we have uh, in the United States. Um, we, with our moves of the past year, we've kind of equalized those tariffs right. now. Um, but uh, I think whatever we can do to try to lower tariff, lower restrictions, uh, will benefit both countries. I, I think, uh, you know, one of the, one of the things that, that we've heard is that because of the prosperity in China, some of their labor's also getting priced out of the market, and so it's moving uh, elsewhere. Right. Jobs are moving elsewhere and everything else. I think that's accurate. Uh, you know, 15, 10 years ago, you were hearing from companies who were moving to uh, places uh, or moving to China to save costs. Uh, we know that our wages have not moved very aggressively here in the United right. States. It's been a problem for many workers who rely upon their wages as their primary income source. Uh, they haven't seen it go up very much. That's not been the case in China, where wages have risen quite dramatically. And, you know, uh, companies there are being challenged to keep their workers because they're making their money and then they sure. go on, on their uh, New Year's break and they go back to their families and they don't come back. Um, and so the, that higher cost uh, in China is that absolutely encouraging activity to be shifted out of China into other low-wage countries like yeah. Vietnam right. and so right. forth. We, another issue, at least in these negotiations that are going on presently with China, relate to concerns about intellectual property and everything. Is the intellectual property issue a an important one for manufacturing. Without a doubt. Um, ah. And, and uh, you know, I think that the, the, the arguments about, you know, making sure that, you know, IP is protected uh, mm -hmm. is, is paramount. Um, I remember having a conversation with one of our major uh, heavy machine manufacturers about 20 years ago. And, and when they talked about the kind of goods that they would be producing or selling to China, uh, they kind of highlighted the fact that they've got a very high range of machines from the least productive to the most productive and costs that were associated with that. And basically they were comfortable selling China the least productive. Uh, and in part they, they understood that uh, some of that stuff would be reverse engineered uh, and, 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 and produced uh, in China. In fact, 
they told a story on how one of their engineers, they were producing in China this lower end product. Uh -huh. they, were, uh, they were approached by a Chinese company in the same line of business and asked if one of their engineers could come help them resolve one of the gearing problems they were having. And so when the uh, engineer went there, what they saw was a completely reverse engineer, identical product, including the paint scheme. Of, of a product that they that they manufactured, um, huh. I said, did he actually help them? Yeah, we helped them. It was a low end product, <laughs> uh, relatively speaking. And it's like you mm -hmm. want to keep good good relations, but it was just a highlighting that he, they were very concerned about bringing the higher value technology. That it would just be, uh, you know. Yeah. Do you hear of these issues involved, like with? Canada and Mexico? Not, not as much. Certainly not as much. I don't hear stories okay. uh, along those lines. And uh, uh, one of the one of the things that struck me is that pattern of employment that you had in your graphs in the manufacturing looked an awful lot like what we saw in agriculture. Right. You know, so the, pa the pattern that we've seen is that after World War II, about one out of every three workers in the United States was in manufacturing, and today it's one out of every 11. Mm -hmm. um, and so people look at that and they're like, well, we're losing all this manufacturing employment. And, um, you know, if you looked at this, it's not the first time we've seen these great transitions. Um, you go back to 1870, for example, mm -hmm. uh, just over 50% of the U.S. workforce was involved in agriculture. Uh, today, agriculture output is as high as ever. We export lots of food all around the world, so not only do we feed ourselves, but other parts of the world, and we accomplish that with just one and a half percent. The story is productivity. Right. Again. Right? And that's, in fact, you as an economist know very well that our statistics are often non egg statistics. Mm -hmm. And it's not that egg is not important, right. but it's just the fact that there's so few workers working in this field. Uh, that when you put in that, those numbers, given the productivity in that sector, blows apart a lot of our numbers to be really incredibly high. A lot of people say that there's a problem in measuring productivity. And it was, uh, is, is that really a big issue? I mean, productivity is a residual. It is. It's, 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 it's an error term, is another way of saying it. Yeah. <laughs> But, but I mean, is it close enough for government? Work? I, I, I mean, think so. <laughs> no, I think so. And, and we, so uh, the, Fed, the Fed does a lot with regard to, of course, we're the ones that produce the industrial production numbers. Sure. And, and it's a value-added number that they try to calculate out in terms mm -hmm. of what we are producing, not just by importing something and polishing it up and selling it. They, they want to remove that kind of right. aspect. So um, the, the Fed says that, you know, the import stuff that comes in that maybe works its way into manufacturing, it may be a small part of what goes on in terms of the industrial production, but it's really doesn't change the story. It's it's a, mm -hmm. uh, maybe a tenth or two on on industrial production. Of its growth rate is okay. is part of it. Most of it is being captured. So what we do is we have the amount of output, a fairly good estimate of the amount of output, and you know certainly through the uh, BLS as well as the real life statistics, uh, as well as the, um, the fact that we have to you know. Uh, companies have to pay the unemployment insurance, so they okay. tell how many hours uh, are being worked by their employee. We have a good sense of the hours that are being contributed. So when your output rises by 5% uh, and the labor hours only go up by 2%, the answer is, where did the rest of the 3% come from? And of course, right. that's the error term that right, you address, right. the right. residual that we call productivity. Well, and, and there's different components to productivity yes. too, right? I mean, there's, right. Labor, there's the, the skill level component, the right. whatever. The capital uh, deepening right. as we talk about right. the, so yeah, productivity, how it gets, it, it, it's, it, we don't have strong numbers to say, well, if we invest this amount, productivity jumps by that amount. It's, it's, it's a combination of a whole bunch of different factors. Uh, and we, we call it multi-factor productivity. Um, but yes, clearly you want to make sure that your workforce is skilled to be able to do the work that, uh, uh, that your manufacturers mm -hmm. need to get done. So a more educated workforce, we refer to that as being a more effective worker. So um, right. that's a very important component. Just having the machines, more machines to do the work. I, you know, in my class that I teach at University of Chicago, I have a, uh, a, a photograph way back when of the uh, uh, ch uh, when China needed to shovel off a highway, okay. uh, remove snow, and they put you know a hundred 
soldiers in, in uniform with shovels. So, of course, I tell my class, you know, I can get anybody in this class, including the women in the class, uh, you know, a truck with a plow on it, and you will be a thousand times more productive than any of those individuals or a lot of them. Uh, so it's giving the tools to do work. It's also giving uh, better machinery. So, mm -hmm. you know, uh, I look at what the R&D is in the United States, which remains all in all quite mm -hmm. solid at between 2 and 3 percent, actually closer to 3 percent uh, of our GDP is spent on R&D, okay. which is kind of giving us the tools of the future uh, for the type of productivity gains is, that we expect. Is that R&D concentrated or evenly distributed across manufacturing sectors, or is it no, more... I, in so, certain areas and in others. It, it pro it pro so you're getting into a question that I'm going to be a little bit more wishy-washy on because I really don't know. Okay. Um, it's it's uh, uh, clearly it's going to be more focused on industries that are kind of the faster growing. Um, okay. So pharmaceutical industry, for example, spends a lot on R&D. Uh, of course, that's the, providing the, the new type of drug. And you know, people sometimes don't um, re remember the fact that pharmaceuticals are basically just chemical companies. Yes. Just taking all these chemicals and kind of combining them in a unique way that has some great benefits uh, for us. Uh, and then once they kind of create that, it, then it becomes a manufacturer, just a factory uh, of producing those, uh, those pharmaceuticals. You, in your chart on productivity, it shows nice growth and then more recently, pretty flat. Right. Is, is that a problem? What's the explanation for that flat? So, um, the explanation... Is it going to stay that way? I, I don't think so. And, and part of it is the fact that we have seen a dearth of investment over this business cycle. Okay. Largely because of the results of the financial crisis, the Great Recession, uh, where nearly 9 million workers lost their jobs. Mm -hmm. Unemployment rates skyrocketed up to 10%. And the response of the economy's growth was very atypical. This has been the slowest uh, expansion that right. we've seen since uh, the Great Depression. It has not been rapidly enough to uh, employ a lot of those people quickly. Mm -hmm. So it actually took until 2014 to get back all those people who lost their jobs right. during the 2008-2009 uh, recession. Um, businesses saw the fact that wages weren't going anywhere. Plenty of employment was out there in the pool of unemployed workers, so they just proceeded to hire workers to achieve this very modest gains okay. that the economy was experiencing. It meant that they didn't need to invest a lot in capital. And as we said, capital is one of the key components for productivity. So I think productivity suffered because businesses just did not so invest. So maybe what we're, what we're seeing in this little bit of period is substituting labor for capital rather than the sort of Typical Absol pattern. That, Absolutely. That we've seen. Okay. The good. The good news is, as mentioned, uh, labor is now becoming scarce, right. uh, and qualified worker is very dear. Right. So we're seeing wages that are starting to move higher, uh, an inability of finding those skilled workers. Right. So businesses are, and, and, and the economy's growth has in accelerated. So businesses are being forced to actually make those capital investments. And I think that will be the harbinger of better productivity numbers down the road. When you see wages go up, it can either go up because laborers become more productive and they're getting paid the value of it, or it's a sign of inflation. Right. Um, are we concerned about the latter at this juncture? How do we, and what's going always, on? The was, Fed is always concerned about inflation. Right. But I, but, but I think. Wait, how, how about trying to parse out right. the differences. So, so we have a measurement called unit labor costs, which okay. basically takes into account both those factors. It looks at how much does it cost to have a worker per output, okay. uh, unit of output that, that occurs. So, um, And so when we look at that, productivity, while wages are rising, productivity is rising faster. So mm -hmm. in fact, right now, unit labor costs on a, on a growth basis has actually been trending down. Uh, so we're not seeing the kind of pressures on costs that would normally be associated with cost push inflation. And that's why profits remain all in all quite so solid. So that would be the kind of thing that would enable the Fed to be more patient. Exactly. Okay. And I think when you look at the Fed forecast going out to 2021, as we do today, um, they're looking at unemployment rates remaining well below what they regard as the natural rate, around 4.2 mm -hmm. to 4.5%, uh, all the way through 2021, remaining below 4%. Mm -hmm. 
And yet their inflation forecast remains right at 2% target as flat uh, as far as 2021. Um, so to me, the rationale of that is the fact that that tight labor market is not going to translate into a wage cost spiral. I, I, sort of one last question that I want to put on the table, uh, and that is um, we're not quite sure what Q4 growth uh, is going to be uh, for 2018. I saw a number, some people were suggesting as low as 2.2%. Uh, percent. Still, that's still above trend. Still above trend. Um, can that continue, or where do we see trend growth in the in the in the near term? So um, and why? So uh, with regard to 2018, while we don't have the GDP number, uh, the Chicago Fed does produce a very nice indicator that I am a big fan of, called the uh, CFNAI, the Chicago Fed National Activity Index. So okay, it's a right. measurement of how the economy is performing on a on a, on a, on a countrywide basis. Um, and and the most we have December, so we have the entire fourth quarter reflected oh, okay. there. And and when you look at that three month moving average, which would capture the fourth quarter for that December value, it is just a little bit over zero, which means it's just a little bit over trend. Which a 2.2 percent number is certainly in the realm of saying it's a little over trend. The Fed uh, right now uh, perceives that the long run trend growth for the U.S. economy is anywhere from 1.8 to 2 percent. Uh, uh, what generates that is a view of our labor force growth, which is probably in the right. 0 0.7 to 0 0.8 it's percent. Low. It's it's low, and then about one to one and a quarter percent on productivity. So uh, you know, and productivity has been a bit low as well over right. the recession. But things are kind of coming back to that normal that, level. That sort of those two numbers, the back of the envelope kind of calculation, is the kind of thing that is an easy thing to explain, and it sort of consistent with what we've seen as well. I'll give you one more plug too, and that is I like the financial conditions index. And right. when you look at that, it says that uh, this concern about Fed tightening may be a bit overblown when you look at where that index is. Right. I mean, point. you have heard a lot of people talk about the fact that the balance sheet is, is, is going down at a, right. at, a, at a $50 billion a month rate. Um, and that is all that tightening. You know, um, I kind of think that if we're truly in a tightening market on that front, you would begin to see uh, the prices of the of the security starting to move quite a bit higher. There's yeah. uh, fewer, and and, and uh, sorry, I'm sorry, go lower. Uh, with the, if the Fed isn't purchasing as much, that would be a downward pr on the price, which would cause the interest rates to move higher on those instruments. And in fact, since uh, most recent period, we were previously at three and a quarter percent on right. ten-year rate. Now we're at two point seven. So it's moving the opposite direction. Well, but the story. treasury has also been helping in that regard by increasing the supply of treasuries in the market, you know, which is going to put downward pressure on prices as well, right? Right, which should again push those interest it's, rates up, and exactly. they're not. Uh, they're actually uh, yeah. having those rates go lower. So again, I don't think of this as a real tightening yeah, uh, to, a, to an extreme degree. Well, thank you very much. This has been really. All right, Bob. Education. Good to, good to chat with you.